Hi everybody, this is Konstantin Leufer from Loyola University Chicago, Theory and Practice of Programming Languages, Spring 2016. So today we're going to focus on language interpretation in some more depth and we will uh, discuss the design of an interpreter for a simple imperative language based on a more in-depth exploration of the underlying foundations. And there are two objectives here, two sets of objectives. One is to understand how these kinds of languages work from the inside in, in more depth and getting more comfortable with the, with the actual practice of that. The other uh, set of objectives is just getting more experience in applying object-oriented and functional programming and design pattern skills as we're uh, practicing uh, these skills in the context of this example, which might not be large in volume, but definitely has some, some intellectual depth. So the roadmap is, we'll first uh, recap the syntax, but we're, we're not focusing on parsing today because we've already looked at parsing um, in some depth. And then we're going to, based on the additional syntax for um, imperative languages, for this particular example, imperative language, we're going to talk about um, mechanisms for giving meaning to the syntax and for uh, formalizing our understanding of what that meaning is. And then we're going to go into a detailed walkthrough of the actual implementation. So let's start with a recap of the syntax. So we're quite familiar, of course, with the expression syntax. Um, we can have constants, meaning numeric literals, or we can have the addition of two expressions or the subtraction of two expressions. We could have other similar operators, which we're just not showing here, but it would be very easy to add those. Um, and then to make the language imperative, we would need to add variables to the, the expression syntax, where the expression could, could include a variable such as x or y, and when the expression gets evaluated, the idea is that the uh, variable will stand for some value at the time of expression evaluation. Okay, And the counterpart of that is when we go down here to the uh, statement syntax, the counterpart of having the variables in expressions is, of course, that we can assign values to variables. So that's the assignment statement here. And then we'll want to be able to um, write programs longer than one line. So we have a, a way to um, compose programs by having sequences of statements, one statement followed by another, and then to um, express any kind of interesting algorithm, we need some kind of loop or, or re repetition construct. So the while loop will serve this purpose. While uh, and then the loop guard or condition, which is an expression, and then the statement, the loop body, which is a statement. Okay. So the next step is to discuss a way to formalize the meaning of uh, the language that has not only expressions but also these statements. Okay, And just up front, I, I want to make it very clear that what we're doing here is just giving a more uh, rigorous formal underpinning to something we already have a working intuition of. So we're already experienced as programmers. So when we look at the um, expression and statement syntax here, we can basically assume that this is like Python or JavaScript type syntax, right? And that we could, um, we could just start writing meaningful programs based on, on this intuition, okay? So that's basically the level that we're at so far. So what, what we're aiming to do here is to take it to another level where we understand this intuition so well uh, that we can actually express it formally and then as a further step 
uh, implement the this formal understanding as an executable uh, interpreter program. Okay, so that's basically where we're heading. Um, so if ever uh, feeling intimidated or stuck or so, just remind yourself that you're doing something that you're already understanding at a working intuition level, and we're just taking it to a, to another kind of deeper level here. So let's look at the next step, which is the uh, concept and corresponding example here of a structured operational semantics. So we need to formalize the uh, these notations that we have uh, as, as part of our syntax. So really the new thing is the idea of a variable and, and a statement. Okay, and the reason these statements are interesting is of course because of the so-called side effects they have on variables. Okay, so we need to understand what a variable is, what it can do for us, and where the variable lives, okay? So variable is just a, a way of calling uh, this broader concept of named state, meaning that you have state, mutable state, meaning you can modify it. it the state might hold one value at a certain point or time during program execution, and then at a later point, it might hold another value. Okay, so that's the idea of mutable state. Named state means that um, there, there is a name that we can use to find a, a variable. Okay, so the variables themselves, we can view them as objects with two simple capabilities. One is looking at the current value, that's the get, and the other is um, throwing away the current value and putting another value into the variable, and that's the set, okay? So the variable is kind of a little storage cell, like a little locker that you can look at, or you can look inside, or you can actually take out and throw away whatever is in there, and then put something else in there. So the variables live in a global top-level memory store that we can call M and the variable names are the keys in in this memory store map so uh, you might have names such as X or Y that map to actual variable or location objects called V or W um, and the, the rest of this discussion is going to be based on this understanding, okay? So to evaluate expressions, we just need to reconnect to um, our expressions example and add the uh, branch for a variable uh, named x or similar, okay? So let's recap the... Um, known cases, okay, so when you're evaluating a constant, C, that's basically a representation of, a, um, of an integer numeric literal, and that just evaluates to itself, to the number that this literal represents. Then let's skip down here to the third and fourth item. So whenever we see um, the evaluation of an operator applied to uh, two sub-expressions, it's always the same story. So evaluate the sub-expressions, usually left to right, and then combine that value by applying the operator to the sub-expressions. And that gives us the result value for um, expression one, operator, expression two. Okay, so we get out a numeric value. The new case is the second item where uh, we're trying to evaluate a variable named x. So what we need to do here is look for x in the memory store. So we um, retrieve the key value pair for x by looking up that, that key value pair for x, and, and there we get the corresponding variable v. And then we get the 
numeric result or the result of evaluating uh, this, this expression by applying the get method or invoking the get method on that variable v. So we're basically starting with a variable name x. We're um, looking for the corresponding um, physical location in memory. And then we're using get to look at the value inside that location. So it's basically those two steps. Okay. And on the uh, slide here, on the embedded image, we're just seeing a, a formalization, like a more formal notation of what's expressed here verbally. Okay. So um, there is this notation uh, that when you're evaluating an expression E in the context of the um, memory store M, then the down arrow means it evaluates two and then the value R. So that's, that's the notation. So it's basically uh, a way of saying, okay, we're going to invoke our evaluator. And if the um, expression is E and the current memory store is M, then we're going to get value r. And uh, these cases zero, to 0 through 3 are just um, a more concise formal equivalent of the, um, the bullet items up here. OK, so constant evaluates to itself. Variable, first step is to look for the variable object associated with variable name or identifier x. And then um, that will evaluate to um, v dot get. So you can read these kinds of things right to left. Like you can say, well, to know what it what evaluating x in the context of m gives us, we'll have to um, obtain v and then apply the get to v to get the value stored inside. Okay, and then here uh, for addition and subtraction, we just say, well, to understand what E1 plus E2 evaluates to in the context of memory store M, um, let's evaluate E1, and that gives us R1, and let's evaluate E2, that gives us R2, and then the final result will be R1 plus R2. And then the same idea for uh, subtraction and other operators. All right. So basically what we've achieved so far is to add um, a branch for evaluating variables. And before we had variables, we didn't need a memory store because um, constants evaluate to themselves regardless of the memory store, right? You don't need to look at the memory store to evaluate the, context, the constant, but to evaluate a variable, you, you need that memory store as a context. And then uh, expressions that might include variables, well, you have to have that context in case your expression uh, includes one or more variables. All right, so let's now move on to um, formalizing our understanding of um, statement evaluation. Okay. And again, in contrast to expression evaluation, statement evaluation or execution does not yield a result. So, you know, evaluation and execution are basically the same thing. They fall under the interpretation um, umbrella. And we can just say execution is when it's a statement that doesn't, need, uh, doesn't yield a result. So why bother evaluating the, or executing the statement? Well, because it might modify the store, and that's what's called a side effect. So it might change whatever is in the uh, variables in the store. And that might mean that later when you evaluate an expression that refers to that variable, that um, might evaluate to something different than before the side effect. OK, so here we have uh, corresponding to the three kinds of statements, we have three uh, cases. And the first one is the most interesting one in some sense. The, you know, at, at the heart of imperative programming is the ability to use variables and the ability to change the value contained in a variable. And that's what 
the assignment statement gives us. So to assign uh, or to, val to um, execute an assignment statement x equal e or x becomes e, we need to evaluate e, which, which is an expression, right? So we, ex we evaluate that and get a result r. Now we need to store this r in the variable that corresponds to x. So now the uh, memory store comes into the picture. Let's look up the variable object v associated with a variable name or identifier x and then we'll just um, perform v dot set r to stick the value into the variable and now next time you look at x you will find this value you just stored all right uh, statements um, sequence just means you uh, execute statement one first and then you execute statement two so both of them might have an effect, a side effect on the memory M. And that's why this is interesting, okay? And the order might matter, okay? So that's why it's called a sequence. And um, finally, the while statement or while loop, the way this works is um, we start by looking at or evaluating the condition E and that gives us a result r and we're using the c language convention so if r is zero that corresponds to false meaning the execution terminates and we don't execute the body s if r is non-zero we take that to mean true and we execute s and then we repeat that whole process meaning we look at e again and in practice, the idea is, of course, that S changes the result of E. So at some point, E becomes false and the loop terminates. Otherwise, we'd have non-termination. All right, so the execution rules, uh, we can formalize them similarly to the way we formalized um, expression evaluation. So the notation is like this, to evaluate um, a statement S in the context of a memory store M or to execute statement S in the context of memory store M um, and what we get is M prime which is M modified maybe in certain places okay so executing statement S in state M results in state or memory store M prime and the execution rules are expressed using this notation okay so to uh, execute an assignment statement x becomes e and then again going from here to the left here we see okay if um, e evaluates to r in um, state m then x becomes e in state m evaluates to or results in state m prime where m prime is the same as m except the um, variable x now contains the value r instead of whatever it contained before right so that's what is expressed here just more formally so for any y other than x m prime is the same as m and just for x, um, m prime of x is v in such a way that v dot get equals r, regardless of what there was in v before. All right, so just again a formal and uh, very detailed, precise way of expressing what. Um, assignment means or what an assignment statement does okay now in looking at the execution rules for the other statements one is for sequence so if we perform s1 or execute s1 in state m and then we get m prime okay then the idea is to execute s2 after s so 
If S already happened, then we have M prime. That's why we need to execute S2 in the context of M prime. And then the idea is that we would get M double prime. Okay, and that's what we're saying here. So S1 followed by S2, executed in the context of M, gives us M double prime. So it's the combination of whatever side effects S1 had, had that um, basically go from M to M prime, and then after that followed by the side effects that we get when we uh, execute S2 in the context of M prime to get M double prime. All right, so just the sequential combination of whatever side effects each statement has in, in the corresponding context at that point. All right, um, then two and three are about the two possible cases that we face when we're evaluating a while loop. So just like in the verbal description, if um, the condition evaluates to zero, then we don't do anything. So how does that get expressed that we don't do anything? Well, here, before and after, we still have M, meaning that M hasn't changed, which means that this while loop is equivalent to doing nothing, to a no-op, okay? But that's just because the condition evaluated to zero. Otherwise, if the, uh, the condition evaluates to a non-zero value R, then the meaning of the while loop is executing the body, and that gives us M prime, meaning S might result in changes to the body, so we get M prime, and then we do the whole thing over, but we do this in M prime as opposed to our starting point M, okay? So this means that now we reevaluate E and we do this in M prime, so it means that E might no longer be true, okay? So at least we there's an opportunity to make progress and for the um, loop guard, loop condition to be reevaluated to a different value uh, ultimately zero. But of course, it's uh, it's the programmer responsibility um, in in typical languages to um, write the code in such a way that the loop eventually terminates. So if the loop doesn't terminate, that's considered a, a logical error in the program. Okay. So to recap, as we see here, the connection between statements is that there is a single global store, and even though here it says M at some point, it says M prime in other points, M double prime, they are connected in the sense that, as we saw in the assignment rule, every time, so as we see in the assignment rule and the other rules, the only way to change the uh, memory store is through an assignment statement. And every time we do that, it changes only the value of a, of, of a single variable. Okay, but other than that, everything else stays the same. So we really have uh, just one memory store that um, that is is basically there throughout the execution of the program, but the values stored in it could change over the execution of the program. And um, in tying back briefly to the um, introductory overview talk about the different uh, paradigms, functional versus imperative, among others, um, the this idea of working on on the memory one variable at a time. This is basically the von Neumann bottleneck. Okay, so this is kind of how the von Neumann bottleneck uh, becomes apparent in the semantics. Okay, so we now have a formal notation that captures our intuitive understanding of the meaning of imperative programs expressed in this kind of syntax, okay? And this is, as I mentioned earlier, 
kind of universal in the sense that um, Python, um, JavaScript, C, etc., have a certain common imperative core that works similarly with, with the key concepts being assignment and what it means, you know, so assignment which modifies the, the store and um, being able to have sequences of, of statements that might include assignments. And uh, then the ability of having loops where we uh, execute the loop guard or loop condition before the loop body and we execute the loop body only if the loop condition is not false. Okay, so that's kind of this common imperative core that we're so familiar with, or mo most of us are. I mean, there are other models in computer science education where you start with um, a functional paradigm and then people have to learn the imperative paradigm later. So, but that's less common. Great, so the next step is to um, go through the interpreter program in some more detail and I will do that in the next video. See you soon.